We are at Townie Meeting 2018 in Orlando, and I'm here with the man, the legend, my idol. Dr. Adonis Terezides graduated from the University of Maryland School of Dentistry, which was the first dental school in the world. Mm -hmm. What, 1840? 1841, somewhere around 1840, there. 1841, and completed a specialty training in oral and maxillofacial surgery at Jackson Memorial Hospital, University of Miami. He practices the broad scope of the specialty with a special emphasis in facial trauma and reconstructive surgery, tissue engineering, digital workflows, minimally invasive techniques, and full arch and medial load techniques. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. On Dental Town, he's known as Bi- Bifid Uvula. Bifid Uvula. Bifid, what is it? Bifid Uvula, but I don't have it. So you have the Uvula. I, back when I made the screen name, I was thinking about going into cleft and craniofacial surgery, so I picked that as like the handle. The so time. is Bifid when you have two? When, when it's split, when yeah. When it splits? Is that so pretty rare? It's pretty rare. It's kind of cool that to see so it. That is so funny. Know? And at the time and I made the handle, I had a patient that had one. I'm like, okay, I'll make my... My username, I guess, on Dentaltown by video. You know, what I love the most about him is, you know, you're sitting there in dentistry and you're all worried about your little crown margin or are you trying to get the contact on the mesial of a composite. And then you see one of his cases. It looks like some kid e- ate either a grenade, a baseball bat, a head-on car wreck. And you look at his cases and your first thought is, I can't believe somebody can even do this who's alive on planet Earth. And then you just do it like it's just no big deal. Dr. Terazitz has contributed many amazing cases and message board posts on Dentaltown. He's everybody's, um, you know what you reminded me of also is um, when I um, when I first started placing implants, I mm-hmm. went down, I did the Mission Institute. And I went down there and you know, here I was all worried about placing one little implant on a maxillary second bicuspid or a first molar and your heart's beating and all this stuff. And then you went down there and you saw Carl. And he would put a scapula on one retromolar pad and go right to the other, reflect the lingual, sew it to this side, reflect the lingual, you know, and just peel this whole thing on like a banana and drop like eight implants. Then he'd turn around and do the upper. And the whole time he was doing it, he reminded me of the most annoying driver in the world who, when they're talking to you, they're, they're looking at you and you're like, turn back, look, 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 look out the windshield, don't look at me. And he's doing this while probably 50% of the time he's talking to you. And you, it, it was like going to war. And then when you came back home, you're in a paintball fight with your single implant. So it just kind of really numbed you mm-hmm. to surgery. When you, when you see somebody do that big of a case, it numbs you that your little dinky case is nothing. And that's what I always think when I see your cases. I mean, you, you're, you, I mean, you must have balls of steel that drag on the sidewalk when you walk. No, honestly not. It's, uh, it, it just becomes a routine. And, and that's really what it is. And that's how a residency structure it begins for us. You know, we start with the basic fundamentals, which is dental alveolar surgery. And which they, is what? Dental alveolar surgery, right? That's, that's the basic part of surgical training for us. We spend a lot of time in the clinic learning to take out teeth and manage emergencies in the middle of the night and start sewing facial lacerations, things like that. And as you progress through the residency, they kind of build that skill set up to the point where it becomes second nature for you to take a chisel or take a saw and actually cut through a jawbone or open somebody's neck from ear to ear to, to get to the mandible. So that's, I think that's indoctrinated in all the, in all the surgery programs, really. You know, but they start you up kind of giving you the basic building blocks and, and they take you to that comfort level. It just it doesn't happen overnight. That's why residency is four to six years or longer, really, for, for people. And, so. and what, what causes the severe cases? Are those usually car wreck? Are they cancer? Uh, are they... Well, there, there's a little bit of all of those things. You know, are they, trauma trauma is a big deal. Uh, interpersonal violence and facial trauma. Interpersonal it's, violence? Yeah, that's usually what it is. You know, we, the, you know Fayette, or Two Fake 32, is my good buddy on Dentaltown. You know, he, he says it, and we've all kind of had this common saying, like, we've never met a mandible fracture that probably didn't deserve it because usually people get in these big bar fights and they, they speak up and somebody's always a little tougher and that's how they end up with a broken jaw or a fractured cheekbone or a broken nose or something that we have to, to treat. But it's that, automobile accidents, motorcyclists without helmets. Um, you know, there's we used a certain to call those of, organ donors. Yes, that's true, they're still called that. They're still called they're that. Still, they're still called that, they're high-speed organ donors. I always had a very hard problem with the uh, the helmet laws because I'm a huge libertarian. I've always been a registered libertarian and. And to me, it's kind of annoying when, uh, you know, most dentists are Republican or Democrat in America. Mm-hmm. And I always thought that's like Bonnie and Clyde, 
uh, Mickey and Mallory. I mean, one one robbed the bank, one drove the getaway car. How can you be proud of either team? I've always been a libertarian, so I've always thought, you know what? If you want to ride a motorcycle without a helmet, that that that's your call. But being an oral surgeon, do you think that right should be taken away from that person? I mean, do I have well, a right to ride a motorcycle down the interstate at 80 miles an hour with no helmet? I'm, I'm sure you do. But then at the same time, there's someone on the other end of it that's still going to be affected by it. There's going to be, you know, a doctor who gets pulled away from his family to have to take care of you in the middle of the night. You know, there's the drain on the healthcare system as well for preventable things. So it, it, it's a tough call. It, it, it's definitely a tough call to, to deal with, you know, but I think common sense has to play a big portion of that. And there's responsibility but we're in America, all around, where so. common sense is not no, very common. That's out the window. That's <laughs> <laughs> out the window. It changes with the feds, I guess. Yeah. Um, but well, if you, know, you were if you were the dictator, if you were the dictator of America, you had no checks and balances. You were the the king. Would I have the right? Would I have to wear a helmet, or would you let me make my own decision? I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, I'd probably want you to wear a helmet. Yeah, I would because I I, I look at the other side of it. You know, you may not have the foresight to think about that, but you probably have a wife and children. You probably have family and parents still to take care of at some point in your life. There's a drain on the healthcare system and a cost. You know, there, there's more to it than just you enjoying, you know, the wind flapping through your hair or just going over Come your barrel. Come on, you didn't have to bring up skull. hair. Come on, we're yeah. only five minutes of this interview. You brought up hair. But, um, and, and it's embarrassing for us being <clears throat> boys, it seems like. Those big um, fights, mm -hmm. motorcycles, it's always a boy. I mean, when's the last time you fixed up a girl um, from a bar fight or a girl from not wearing a helmet a on a times, motorcycle? A couple times a year, for usually for the bar fights. And then how many times for a boy? Well, a lot more times it's for interpersonal violence, domestic violence, you know, usually. That's when that's when I usually end up with it, usually with the female mandible fractures and facial trauma, and then automobile accidents. Very rarely is it ever a sports injury. Every once in a while, you get you get a kid that's got a sports injury, a baseball to the to the mid face, and they get an orbital floor fracture or a sinus fracture. Um, usually, it's it's sad, but you know there's a significant amount of, of women that we see that come in from domestic violence. Well, you know, women, it, it's very sad. Um, they started nine one one a long time ago. By the way, I don't know if you realize this. Nine one one just updated last week, where you can text nine one one. Yes. I mean that they are they should be the. We always make fun of the Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, the driver's license. We really should make fun of 911. I mean, the few times I've ever called 911 is to report a car accident. They're like, well, can you give a description of a car? It's like, dude, I can FaceTime my 80 year old mother. Why can't I FaceTime 911 and show you the deal? And then here it is, 2018, after I've sent a gazillion texts, I can finally text 911. It's like, the government is always the, the last yeah. person to, to do the obvious. Um, but, um, but yeah, you can text 911. But but I was looking at the data on 911. They were reviewing it because of the new text technology. But the number one call for every state when it came out, I thought, oh, you know, Grandpa had a heart attack or someone had a car wreck. But it's domestic violence is the number one call of every state in every year. And I also read that 95 percent of the time a woman is murdered, it's by her lover. So these these um, what goes on behind closed doors of families? It's is, pretty scary. When you work in a scary. trauma center, you see some some pretty crazy things. And, uh, and it also makes me rethink the um, the nuclear family. The, the the Americans, you know, when you're 18, they kick out the kids, and then when grandma um, doesn't know her name, they put her to nursing home. So about five percent of American women will die in a nursing home. But that's only in, you know, the Western countries, like United States, Canada, Western Europe. When I travel to uh, South America, Asia, um, India, the, the whole family lives together. They call it a nuclear family. I forgot what they call ours. Um, I think they call it love marriages um, versus nuclear. But, but six billion out of seven billion live in a nuclear family. Well, you know, I was talking to Dennis about that nuclear family. Well, you couldn't beat the hell out of your wife. When you're when you're living with your dad and your brother and your mom and um, um, babysitters, when when those women dentists in India go to work, their their mom and their grandma and their aunts babysit the kid. And and as the older I get, I really think the um, the rest of the world nuclear family is probably a better idea I think, I mean, than, I think than it's the a West. Pretty great concept, or some hybrid in between. You know, well, maybe it's, too many people in the house is well. Is well too it's much, interesting but. because it's um. It sounds um, 
so the mom and the grandma and grandpa live here, and there might be a couple of kids living in there. But then the the sister um, li lives next door with her family, and so it's all. It, it might be even four or five houses just on one cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. but but they all live, you know, in, in a close enough relationship where I could go to your house and borrow a cup of milk or a cup. I mean, they're right. they're all right there on top of each other, and it just seems to me. Um, a lot of advantages to that. And the arranged marriage isn't that, oh, you have to marry Billy. It's just that you're only going to date leads I serve up to you. So you, some of those people might have been fixed up 10 times before they were married. But the key is all the leads were qualified. I see. And it's funny, when you go into business, you don't want to just start dialing out of the phone book. You want qualified leads. I mean, if you're selling to dentists, you want the list of just dentists. And in sales, you always want qualified leads, and in um, those nuclear families, all the dating is served up on leads, and they have about a 10% divorce rate, and they call it the Western world having a love marriage, where you go out and fall in love, and you have a 50% failure rate. Or higher is still growing, I bet. Yeah, so, so um, how long have you been an oral surgeon? Uh, since 2013, officially. So. 2013? Yeah, yeah. So that was after a... After residency. And yeah, how long was residency? Six, resi years, six, six years year residency. residency. Yeah. And then, so 2013, so five years. Um, I practiced at general dentistry for a couple of years in between. I actually started residency, <clears throat> had a family emergency, and uh, left residency. <clears throat> Take care of... I'm an only child, so took care of my mom and some family issues that we had. Did general dentistry for a couple of years, and then uh, found an opening again back into a program. Uh, as an intern, which was no guarantee, went and did the internship. They liked me enough to keep me around, and I stuck around for another four years on top of that. So ended up doing six years of surgical residency before it was all said and done. And how's your mom doing? Better. Great. Nice. Good yeah. job, buddy. Nah, the, she's the, good. So the, the no, good family son. comes first. So. Family first, Absolutely. business second. Absolutely. That's what I always say. Um, so a lot of, um, you know, there's nine specialties, oral surgery specialties, orthodontics, endodontics, periodontics. The, the one that never gets talked about, which is my favorite, is public health. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I started uh, my practice at 87, the first thing we did is we blocked off every Friday. It took two years to fluoridate the water of Phoenix, Arizona, because I thought it's better to prevent the decay than right. set on assembly line drilling, filling, and billing. And then that expired after 20 years, and we got involved and got it passed again. Um, I think that... Um, it really bothers me about our profession when I see the data that 8% of emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin. Oh, it's huge. And so many of these dentists, um, they they don't do extractions. They they give them, uh, they're as bad as a hospital. They give them Pen VK and Vicodin and tell them um, to go to an oral surgeon or go somewhere else. And then this person ends up in the middle of the night in the emergency room. How does a young kid, podcasters are young, 25% are still in dental school, the rest are under 30. Mm -hmm. How does this kid go learn how to do exodontia, extractions, get people out of pain? Well, I, you know, I haven't followed what the dental school curriculum is like now, but at Maryland, when I was in school, I, I did the oral surgery elective or selective that they had where twice a week we actually did more advanced dental alveolar surgical things. We used the hall drill. We did tori. We got we got into more advanced pre-prosthetic surgery. I was doing tuberosity reductions and we were doing full mouth extractions with alveoloplasty and it was closely supervised by oral surgery attendings, but we really were doing the cases. So when I came out of dental school, I felt pretty comfortable taking out teeth and it was a, it was a good record. I knew how to suture fast and I was able to get up and running in, in my oral surgery program right from the get-go on July 1st. Uh, you know, to have a basic surgical foundation for it. Took out several hundred teeth while I was in school. I don't know how that is now, but I, I, I see, I have AGD residents at my, at my VA hospital, because I'm full-time at the VA hospital now, and they're coming out with very, very minimal exodontia and oral surgical background skills, and I, so I think they're, they're being failed that opportunity in school. I think that there's been a big focus on shifting into a lot of digital technology probably at school. I mean, these guys are getting CEREC training and some of the things that they need, but they're missing a lot of the fundamental anatomy, physiology, basic science things that they need to have as a as true fund of knowledge to practice any dentistry with that. And so I'm, I'm less worried about them being able to pull a tooth if they can't tell me sometimes some of the muscle attachments underneath where they're, where they're working or what they're injecting through. And they can't tell me the names of the nerves that they're injecting. And they're coming out very bright, smart kids. They're coming out from school now. So I think that they, there's so much to pack into four years 
that they just get brushed over, you memorize it for a test and it's gone. As far as what schools are permitting them to do for, tr for teaching, there's a lot of schools now that don't have enough specialists actually teaching the specialty procedures to them as well, where say, you know, exodontia may be supervised by, by whoever the clinic supervisor is for the day, whether it's an endodontist or whether it's an oral surgeon, whether it's a practicing general dentist, and you know, there's a different subset of skills, but there's something to be learned about learning specialty procedures under direct supervision from a specialist, you know, to impart that knowledge and impart that safety factor that I just don't see happening now. True, true or false, in your opinion? Um, when someone says they want to uh, start placing implants, I always say, well, you have to master exodontia first. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't start placing implants if you don't have the surgical skills to remove the teeth. You, you, need, you, need, you need the skills to extract the teeth before you start replacing. Is that true or false? Well, I think it's true. I think it's very true. And it's a back to the same thing I told you for becoming a full-fledged surgeon. You start with the basics and you develop a certain skill set. You have to be able to lay a flap before you can place the implant. You have to be able to know how to suture that flap back and how to manage that tissue first. And that comes with basics of being able to first understand how to give a block and give good profound anesthesia where you need to work. Being able to manage some of the complications. You can drill into something and, and deal with some significant bleeding. Well, if you know how to pack a socket that's bleeding with gauze or whatever you need to get control of a hemorrhage from an extraction site, Maybe if you had an osteotomy of a drill that went too far or whatever, you can learn to manage that, that portion as well. So I, I think if you can do the basic subset and you have the confidence to pull some teeth and to pull teeth comfortably and then see how you and manage that patient post-operatively as well, manage your swelling, manage your discomfort, manage your dry socket, if you have that basic fund of knowledge, then you can take it to more advanced surgical skills, which maybe might not be technically as demanding but there, it's a high stakes game when you're putting in something that's going to be permanently implanted into somebody's jaw. You know, once it's in, it's in. And I think that's a high stakes game. So if you can start with the basic skill set, for sure you can continue your knowledge and your training to place implants. And implants get old after a while. They really do. Yeah. They do. There's so much in dentistry has to offer. And you have to look at what your time is. And, but, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends who actually went, they did a bunch of implant continuums, they spent a lot of money and got on courses, they placed implants, and then they find that, yeah, okay, it's a novelty and it's cool and they're doing some surgery, but then they find out that, you know, really there are other things they can do that's more profitable for them as well. Oh, yeah. So. Um, it's the, the highest is with orthodontics. Yeah. They say, I want to start doing orthodontics, and you come back and they, they take all the courses, they, they band up 10 cases, you come back two years, and they go, my God, I mean, I don't want to be married to someone for monthly for two years yeah. for uh, for well, i'm know. a results guy i couldn't do ortho anyway for that very reason yeah. i need, and, to, I need and, to cut something and, see and i'm seeing it already in sleep at me i mean i almost every friend of mine in phoenix who we we all went through all those courses together yeah. you know um five six seven years ago and i, I don't think it, i don't know any of them that's still doing it uh, but i want to i want to ask you um i i think the what the internet is doing uh, well, actually, not the internet. You know, uh, it's actually the smartphone is uh, really flattening the earth. I mean, you used yeah. to have big um, differences in quality of healthcare between continents and countries, and it's really come together quickly. And I noticed the German oral surgeons are not quiet about what they think of American oral surgeons and the fact that they they believe kind of like when I was little. Um, first time me or my five sisters got a cold, they took out our tonsils. Mm -hmm. So I have no tonsils or adenoids. The Germans feel that way about wisdom teeth. They say in America, they pull the wisdom teeth that they exist. And in Germany, they say they pull about a third as many wisdom teeth as Americans. Do you think Americans pull too many wisdom teeth that would have lived a happy life forever? Or do you think the Germans are too conservative or? I think they're maybe a little too conservative, to be honest with you. When you think the Germans when you, when, are too conservative? Yeah, when you, uh, and again, it's probably, I don't know their, their model of healthcare completely, but I think that there's a certain aspect of socialized medicine with, with them as well. Um, right. And they may not, they obviously don't practice the same way we're sedation the same way that we do as well. So when they're doing it, they're probably doing more cases under local anesthesia or with an anesthesiologist in a hospital setting, is my understanding. Um, and that, that's the way it is with a lot in Europe. You know, in Europe, most people have their wisdom teeth and most of the rest of the world removed under local anesthesia, which is fine, but we have a different philosophy the way we look at things. We try to get the patients early 
15, 16, 17 years of age before the roots are fully developed, before they've ever had a problem, before there's been any pathology, when we know that that patient is healthy. That's usually sometimes a young teenager's first real experience with dentistry other than maybe a couple fillings or something as a pediatric patient. And they're scared and they have a lot of apprehension. And our philosophy is to take a patient like that and be able to take them through one of their first surgical experiences and show them that it can be a pleasant, easy, manageable, not so fearful, not so difficult uh, uh, experience. And if we can take that patient and turn them around and say, okay, here, I'm gonna put an IV in your arm, I'm gonna sedate you, you're gonna wake up and not remember anything, you're gonna get chipmunk cheeks for a couple of days, but after that, you know, it is a rite of passage and we look at it that way. Um, and for us, we know that at that age, statistically, the complications are the least, less risk to the nerve, less risk of developing cysts and tumors from a naughty wisdom tooth that hasn't had anywhere to go, that's been impacted in the mandible for so many years. Um, and, and so I think that's really a way of practicing a preventative sort of medicine. Because on the other end of it, is the other end of the spectrum, is when I get a patient in their 50s or 60s who's now got COPD, heart disease, has had four cardiac stents and triple bypass, and now they have an impacted wisdom You just gave tooth. away my health history. That's a HIPAA violation. Well, my gosh. actually, you gave it away. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the fact is, is that now this patient is a significant anesthetic risk. They are a surgical risk patient that is also going to have a much more miserable recovery. And now they have an endogenic tumor and a mieloblastoma or an OKC in the mandible. OKC? And yeah, they have an OKC, an odontogenic keratocyst, or what they call now a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. It's an aggressive cyst in the mandible. It can cause some people to need a resection. That's not easy to take Ms. Jones at 60 years of age now to do something that was completely preventable by having taken out her wisdom teeth as a teenager. So you won't find very many oral surgeons who have children of their own who leave those wisdom teeth in. So we practice what we preach. It's not that we're just doing it because you've got money to spend on, on, on your daughter. You, uh, you know, we, we believe in that philosophy because we see the other end of it and the benefit of getting it done early in life. Interesting, because when I, um, when I started having a family, the whole big deal back then was um, that... Um, um, Circumcision was just a religious thing. Mm -hmm. It had no um, medical validills, culture, and all the young hippies in the 80s were um, not circumcising their little boys. And almost every single one of my friends that fell in that trap ended up having to take their boy back at age two or three and getting an epidural and putting his lower half to sleep to circumcise him because of all the uh, urinary tract infections. And what was funny is all the older 60-year-old pediatricians were saying, this isn't a good idea, this isn't a good idea. There's a reason they figured that out 2,000 years ago. You know what I mean? And uh, so, so what percent, if you saw 115-year-old Americans, mm -hmm. what percent would you recommend the wisdom teeth coming out based on a pano at age 15? At 15? I'd say somewhere between 85 to 90 percent. 85 to 90? Yeah. And what would be the criteria of the 10 percent? There's that some people that aren't developed enough where I think if they wait another oh, okay. year or two. Oh, okay, well, say, say 16 or 17. Okay, 16 I or mean, 17 is much what, what, higher. What, what percent of Americans would you say need to have their wisdom teeth taken out? Or would benefit probably, from having their wisdom teeth? Probably 95 percent of Americans. 95 percent? Yeah. And what would be the, five, the one in 20? Um, the ones who don't have it? And the ones who are actually in a functional occlusion, in an area that we can probably maintain a decent hygiene regimen there. Yeah. And there's some people that just have a mandible that's large enough to accommodate it. Yeah, and also um, I, I learned that re research is tough because the New York Times was did an excellent expose that there was no research on floss. Now, of course, every dentist in America, every hygienist in America said, no, no, no. There's massive benefits to flossing every day. Sure. But the New York Times was accurate in pointing out that there is no I mean how would you do it what would you get identical twins and one floss and one doesn't floss and then diet. Uh, it's impossible to do yeah, that yeah I mean really. it's so multifactorial um sedation um there's another international thing um yeah. I believe it was the United Kingdom who said that um you can't do the surgery and the sedation right. and then when you go to America in the hospitals that's the law I can't I can't remove your appendix and run the IV right so in American hospitals, you have to have an anesthesiologist and a surgeon. UK, it's that way for everyone, including oral surgeons. And the only people who 
step outside that norm predominantly or your professional oral surgeons yeah. where you all do the sedation and you all do the surgery what do you think of that discrepancy well i think it's a great model and i think that we because it's been able to open up being able to provide a lot of care at a lower cost to patients and it's a proven model that's worked very well for so many years um, because our training is really it's second to none when it comes to actually getting anesthesia training um, but i do see the times changing and i, I think at some point it's going to go away from our profession partly because you know, there's been, again, a dilution of some education, even, even in oral surgery curricula at some programs. Um, there has, you know, just like there's been a dilution of, of basic dental teaching in dental school. But at the same time, there is a different kind of standard. We're dealing with patients now who have medical conditions that maybe they didn't have 20 years ago. We're seeing more obese children now in, in, our, in our offices. That's an airway risk that we didn't have to face as much, say, in the 70s and 80s, now with this obesity epidemic that we have. We've, we're seeing kids who are on a lot of recreational pharmaceuticals, things that beyond what maybe they were doing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they're coming in now. And, and these are all anesthetic risk challenges that we may not be picking up on. And there has been an uptick in office-based you know, mortality and morbidity that, that has occurred. Fortunately, most of it is not actually in oral surgery offices, but we all get lumped into the same group when it does happen, and it's sensationalized in the media as well. But if you look at how many millions and millions of anesthetics are done every year by safely in oral surgery offices, and there may be 20 deaths or 30 deaths in a, in a year across the country, which is tragic, and it, it's, it's heartbreaking, and it just kind of wrecks the career of someone who's taking care of a patient that they, they really care about what they do. But on a scope of what that is statistically, it's... It's less than amount killed by lightning. Like, yeah. 50 Americans are killed each year by a television falling on them. And, yeah. you know, so... And there's less people that die during sedation during medical procedures, basically. Um, but I do think it's gonna go away at some point. You know, we, uh, there's not enough dental anesthesiologists. There's not enough medical anesthesiologists who would feel comfortable working in a dental operatory sort of environment. And we just, there's not a way to make it efficient to be able to take patients to have them sedated for treatment. And unfortunately in this country, people want sedation and they don't want to be done under local anesthesia. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with local, but the expectations are such that they, there's a very high demand on the practitioners and it's just the, the kind of state of the society that we're in right now. They want sedation, they want it done. And sometimes people push the envelope. In my practice, I was very fortunate because I have hospital privileges and I have also ambulatory surgery pri privileges where I was working in private practice. That if there was somebody that I just didn't feel comfortable, that didn't make me feel safe, that I would be doing the, running their sedation, running their general anesthesia in my office, I would very easily tell them it's local anesthesia, if you're willing to do it this way, or we go to the ambulatory surgery center. If you're not comfortable with that, I can help you find another surgeon that may be willing to entertain that idea. But an ambulatory means uh, ambulatory surgery, meaning like an, like an operating of like a, like a center where maybe an orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon would do outpatient surgery. Not necessarily but the ambulatory in a means walking in and walking out. Yeah, walking and walking out sort of deal. But it's 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 a surgery center with operating room, but they have a full medical staff, anesthesia there, and, and an operating room to take care of the patient. Let somebody else deal with the anesthesia at that point. I just walk in to do my surgery, and they they're responsible for managing the anesthesia. Um. So. Um, I, it's more expensive. It's significantly I posted more expensive. A, uh, I posted a map today on Dental Town, and it's um, it's quite. Um, I saw it. I actually saw it. It's one with the, with the population where they yeah, live. Yeah, thank. Uh, I saw it this morning. Uh, yeah. So the um, so there there's two debates when you look at specialties. When 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 you look at the fact that half of America lives in the shaded areas, uh -huh. uh, I, I I think, um, you know, I grew up in Kansas, so I'm completely sensitive to the flyover state. Because if you ever turn on any news, it's Miami, New York, L.A., San Fran. No one ever talks about Kansas and Nebraska, North and South Dakota. No one ever goes there. They only fly over it. But, but let, let's look at um, half of America lives in the 19,008 small towns. And a lot of those guys sit there and think, well, you know what? My population, when I tell them they need to drive two hours in a town, they say, freaking pull it. So a lot of them want to... Um, learn to place implants, they want to learn anesthesia. I always say, I, I always say, my gosh, just 
go find an oral surgeon or a periodontist to so come to your practice one day a month and save up all your wisdom teeth and implants. Do that. Same thing with anesthesia. A lot of them say, oh, I want to learn sedation. I say, dude, when you, I've had four kids. They were all in the middle of the night. The, when, the, when they wanted an anesthesiologist, they just did the Motorola pager. The guy was there in five minutes, and I said, where were you? And he's like sitting at the IHOP, sitting at the Waffle House. You know, I always say, just have someone come in and do it and split it with them 50-50. Um, they've done 10,000, you know. So my, my specific question is, do you think um, these rural dentists should learn how to place implants? Yes. Or do you think a specialist should come in one day a month and and split a 50-50 place? I think, I think the key is treatment planning and learning to be able to identify which ones they should do and which ones they should require from a specialist to do. Bringing a specialist into your office, is, it's, it, it's always an interesting dilemma to deal with because we can never function in a dental office the same way we can in our own specialty office. It may look a little bit similar, but it's not. The workflow is different. Your assistants are different. The setups are different. The available instruments that you may have, that one time you may need some special instrument that's packaged on a shelf to use in this one case, you're not going to have it there. Um, the dental operatories are not very set up and, and it, it, it's, I find it difficult to be able to work in some of these operatories and the idea of say I could never put a patient to sleep in my buddy's office working out of that chair. Maybe I'll go and take out a tooth under local anesthesia in that chair and I still feel crammed sometimes in that operatory or you know even where the suction reaches from or having to use a dental hose that's off, off, the, off the dental chair versus a wall suction. Even that restriction of the assistant holding a suction makes it more difficult for us to work than if they're using a surgical suction on, on tubing that's loose and passive where they can move it around and not fight, not, not fight the tug. I think, I think what's important is that every dentist, no matter where they practice, they, they get continuing education. They look for mentorship, especially if you're in a rural town where you're gonna to have to be able to pull a tooth, do an incision and drainage. And the key to all of this is treatment planning. You can identify the cases that are slam dunk cases that you know, the risk of a complication is low and that you know, these are the implants that I should be doing. This one's maybe a little bit beyond my skill set or a little too risky for, the, for, the, for this patient based on their medical history. Maybe it looks like an easy implant, but maybe there's some complications and things that can arise from the other direction where maybe I'm not comfortable managing this patient's anticoagulation medicines or so forth. But there has to be a balance somewhere in between. There's simply not enough oral surgeons to manage all the extractions that need to be done. There's not enough oral surgeons and dental anesthesiologists to provide sedation and, and analgesia and comfort for patients. And quite frankly, we can't place all the implants and take out all the teeth. We just, there's not enough of us to do it. And it's hard to make a patient drive two, three hours. They have transportation issues. They have, but I think that we need to, as a profession, embrace the fact that there has to be a give and take with this. And some people, they, they say, I want to do everything in my office to keep it because they look at it purely from a financial and business standpoint. Maybe that's not in the best interest of a patient either. So, so she just graduated from dental school. She's $350,000 in debt. And the first thing she's going to say, dude, we didn't place one implant in school. We didn't do one sedation course. Where would you recommend her go for training to do surgery and sedation? Uh, I want them first to actually get really good at Crown and Bridge first because they came out of school and they still got to know what their bread and butter is. Their bread and butter is doing fast, efficient, aesthetic, functional Crown and Bridge first. If they can do that, then they move on to the implant stuff. You've got to have a foundation. They barely know occlusion coming out of school. So I don't want them dealing with implant occlusion really until they can do Crown and Bridge well. And if they can do Crown and Bridge well, they're also going to pay off that debt fast enough and then you got a little spare cash to start saying, I'm going to get into more, maybe a year or two, maybe three years in. That's maybe the time you want to start. You've got to be seasoned as a dentist. First, you've got to learn how to run multiple chairs, which they, don't, they can't do. So to get into an implant procedure where they've got to have a sterile setup and they've got to place an implant as efficient and as fast as an oral surgeon or a periodontist can in 15 to 20 minutes or an hour, depending if it's multiple implants, they've got to hit that record first. If they can do that and they can run a schedule and they know now that, yes, I've got a two hour time slot that I can dedicate to placing the implant for Miss Jones, great. Because now they've understood the rest of the treatment planning. Because if they're just looking at a space and say, I want to place an implant here, well, what about the adjacent teeth? What are you doing for those adjacent teeth? Are you going to need to crown those later? Do you need to provisionalize them? Are you thinking about opening the bite first? I think they have to get into that mindset first before they start doing surgical things that are irreversible. That's, I mean, and I see that from my AGD residents that come in. They're placing, our AGD residents come in and they place anywhere from 50 to 100 implants each before they leave our AGD residency. They restore probably over 100 implants in that year along with comprehensive dentistry that they're, they're getting trained on. 
but they have to have some background first. And you know, I, I think it's important that especially if you didn't get that great a background in dental school, I, I think the first thing they need to be thinking is, you know what, suck it up for another year and go do a residency somewhere. Get a general dentistry residency, GPRA, GD, so you can get your speed up a little bit and get your treatment planning mind and focus first. And you'll probably get more implant experience by that point. To set the foundation to say, okay, now, I did 50 implants, so I can go to this guy's course maybe, a Mish or a Garg you know, sort of course. Maybe I'm at the point where I'm ready to go ahead and pull the trigger and spend another 10 grand and go to the Dominican Republic and do some live patient cases. Or maybe, you know what, I wanna go take a few more CE courses, regular ones, or join a study club first and learn a few more fundamentals before I'm ready to pull the trigger and go spend another 50,000 or $100,000 on implant instruments to, to worry about that part yet. I think um, yeah, um, my dental office in Phoenix is right down the street from the Arizona Cardinals um, headquarters. Mm -hmm. On my street, there's a lot of coaches and players that where I live, and in my practice, we have a lot of um, coaches and players in the Cardinals. And <clears throat> young boys always ask them, "What advice would you give me to get, get into the NFL?" They said, "Well, in college, just just focus on a block, a tackle, a pass, and a catch." Just nail those four fundamentals. Don't worry about all these fancy plays and all that stuff. Just, you know, when it when it when it that ball's coming to your numbers, catch Get it. Get it in your hands. Catch it. You know, and just, then run like hell. So so when you come out of dental school, you're gonna need two, three, four years of your basics, fillings. You have to. Blendo, they gotta learn crowns. how to talk to a patient first. Yeah. You can't sell an expensive implant case to someone if you're so wet behind the ears right now that you still have difficulty being able to explain why they need to have a composite. Get, get them ready for you know whatever else they need. I mean, it, it's really, it's comprehensive treatment planning. And, and I think that that's lacking in, in, in the, because um, there's not enough time to get that taught, not enough time to get that experience. And technology's changing so fast too. They come out, they get bombarded by you know wonderful products, but how much of it is really necessary if you can't get the fundamentals set? And you know, when, once they start realizing the use of dental materials, you know, they, they understand when they're gonna do an Emacs crown versus, look, I'm an oral surgeon, I'm talking to you restorative dentistry stuff now. They got to know the difference between when they're going to use a zirconia crown versus an Emax versus a PFM, you know, whatever they're going to, whatever they're going to plan to do. They they have to understand that relationship with the patient. They got to understand occlusion. They got to understand the bite first before they start putting things in that are not going to have a PDL and be mobile. That once it's integrated, it's in, and then once it's integrated, maybe that's fine. But what about the other teeth on the other side of it that maybe we should have had some other plan? And I just want to remind you, we, we did a podcast um, yesterday with Gordon Christian, and we were talking, he lectured here yesterday, but one, one thing I just want to, when you come out of school, don't read into all those different types of crowns also. There's nothing wrong with the PFM. Emax is gorgeous, and you can use it on molars. There's no big fracturated yeah. Emax on molars. And as far as uh, Zirconian goes, only Glidewell's Bruxer is holding up under all this long-term research. All these new zirconium things. Um, the one thing that I want you kids not to do that I did is when I got out, I got all caught up in all these marketing and advertising and courses and tried all these new materials. Um, I did a thousand Dicor crowns cemented with Duralon that I learned at a course. Guess what percent of them fractured? No idea how many. All of all them. Of and guess how many I got to redo for free? All of them. Then, then Hureus Kulzer came out with art glass. Within three years, the art came off the glass. Are people doing those CapTech crowns at all anymore? Do you remember CapTech? Yeah. When, when, when I was a GP, we had we had CapTech as well, you know, and it, you know, and we did. I did. I don't know, maybe a couple hundred of them because I was pushed in the company I worked for to, to be doing the CapTech crowns. And I always wonder how they held up over time. They they, they did they did, did really they did really well. But I'm just telling you, kids. The old guys always say, well, let the dental kindergartners come out. They'll get all excited in, in a seminar and some NASCAR speaker. I call them NASCAR speakers because in NASCAR, they have all the uh, uh -huh. all the logos of the stuff they're selling or being promoted by. But in the dental lectures, they, they forget to put on all their badges. And then you buy this stuff, then it all fails. Um, I declare um, Targus Vectris. That all fell apart. I, when you're 55, when shit comes out, you say, let the idiots do it for five years because there's nothing wrong with Emax. There's nothing wrong with Bruxer. There's nothing wrong with zinc phosphate cement. There's nothing wrong. So when you got some, like I still use Impergum. You know why? Because it started out as a German company, Espy, and then 3M out of Minnesota bought it. And you know what? I've been using it since I think 1984. 
it's, it's, it's perfect. So someone will come up to me and say, well, you need to try this. Why? This has been perfect for 30 freaking years and you want me to try something else? I mean, so, so don't be that bleeding edge. And also a lot of you think that um, markets are efficient. They always teach that in school. They always teach you economics. Well, if markets are efficient, then explain why sometimes the stock market in like March of 2000, NASDAQ was at 5,600, 5,800, and the next thing you know, it's 1,800. That, that doesn't seem very efficient. The, you know, Adam Smith said that um, two people evaluate, I want to trade my cup of coffee uh, for your cup of milk or whatever, and trade's very efficient. Trade is no longer efficient because businesses spend a billion dollars a day marketing to you, clouding your judgment, giving you emotion, giving you all this stuff, and it's 20% off, and buy now, it's the convention special, yeah. and you just make a lot of really bad decisions. So I always say, slow down, Spanky. Slow down. Um, tell me something new. I want to watch your five years. Speaking of new, is what can you categorically say sedation is safer in 2018 than it was in the 80s when I was go? It seemed like in the 80s it was a lot of uh, sedation was narcotics, where the only antidote is wearing slowly wearing off, uh, and then they came out with like Versed and Reversed. Um, um, is, is sedation or the pharmaceuticals you use today safer than in the 80s? Well, I th I think they are. Um, you know, we've we've had a shift in in the 80s. You know, a, a big Big use was brevitol and methohexatol was 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 a medicine that we used in combination with the with the benzodiazepine like Versed. But the methohexatol, you know, had certain issues with it. It was more prone to giving you a laryngospasm, having airway issues and desaturations. Most of us in the younger generations have moved on to say propofol. Propofol is a very safe drug. Uh, has a very safe. That's not what Michael Jackson well, said. Well, Michael Jackson you know, <laughs> also had it administered by somebody that wasn't monitoring him, and he wasn't monitored while he was getting it. But propofol as a medication has very low side effects. Um, and, and I worked in a practice with you know, a phenomenal surgeon, my partner, who preferred to use Brevitol because it worked well for him for all these years. And, uh, but I noticed the difference. I would hear his monitor go to the DSAT, and he'd have to stop and, and hold the airway up, open longer, you know, to kind of get the patient, you know, Back to, back to breathing during the time. That never really happened with my propofol, but I might have to redose the propofol more often than he had to do the brevitol, but for him that stopping in between to do a redose or rebump of the medicine was enough to say, you know what, I'm not gonna deal with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and just do it the way I do efficiently this way versus stopping to rebump. So everybody has, it's, it's a balance. I think we are safer in the sense of technology. We have more monitors and more monitoring requirements. I think the educational requirements and residency programs have increased as well when it comes to it, but there's a tip side to it too. Again, there's a lot of diseases we're seeing in younger people now that we didn't have before. We're seeing patients with more sleep apnea issues, obesity issues, recreational pharmaceutical issues, which may lead to underlying cardiac issues. That's things that we can't necessarily always predict or protect from, so there, it's a balance. With it. Is, is the... Um is the legalization of marijuana, which is getting more, um, I live in Arizona, it was the only state at the last presidential election, I think seven states voted, six put it in, Arizona still held out. Is that gonna increase more um, health history concerns for the average general dentist you know, people I coming th in? I think it will. I, I really think it will. I think that maybe there is a therapeutic place for it in the spectrum, um, in terms of the medicinal side of it, but I think we already deal with that a lot. I mean, I see that a lot in the college kids already. They, they all admit to it that they that they use marijuana. The question but, is, but, is but who what is if, that going to be what a if, gateway for for the next? But but no, I, I mean, in a dental appointment, what what if, what if they they um, smoked right before their appointment and they're coming in for a I'm root canal on the treat, crown? I'm not happy to treat them at that point because sometimes these things are laced with other medications and other drugs in them as well, um, and there could be there could be issues. So for me, it's a concern if if someone is high and that they're not able to maybe recall what they were signing an informed consent for or that they're not gonna follow post-op instructions or that they're just gonna be uncooperative. I mean, I've seen that happen. You know, patients will come in and they were nervous and maybe they smoked the joint in the car before coming in for their sedation. Um, but if they don't, don't seem right, I don't wanna give them more medicines on top of it that may have some sort of interaction with it. I'm, I'm very happy to cancel the case. And, and just and, do it. And, um, I don't have to do that case. I'm in, um, I'm in Phoenix, which is a retirement community. I'm, just, I'm sure of Florida. 
huge retirement community. A lot of the old guys self-medicate. When they have anxiety at the dental office, they have a couple of belts before they come in. Yeah. And you can smell it on their breath. Where, where, where do you draw the line? Where, where, where does that bother you, and when is that acceptable? <sighs> it, it's, it's a balance, and it comes with some experience. You know, it comes, it comes with time. If I think that the patient's able to sit through a procedure, and, and I look at it, I say, okay, am I just pulling one tooth on you under local? I'll probably tough it out and, and go with it. If I, I need something that's going to be for a couple hours worth of work on them, I may not feel so comfortable giving them medications over top of whatever else they might have in their system. You can always reschedule. And I tell them, I, I'm very honest with them. I said, listen, I'm concerned about your safety. You come back, we'll reschedule you next week or whatever, and we'll, we'll deal with you at that point, but you cannot. 72 hours, I tell them, so in the hopes that I'll get 12 hours out of this. <laughs> Honestly, I tell yeah. them, 72 hours in the hopes that I can get 12 hours of them not being on whatever they're on, you know, to do that. And, and for me, a bigger concern is something like cocaine or an amphetamine, not necessarily marijuana, but, you know, we have big methamphetamine problem in a lot of states now and a uh, big cocaine problem. If they come in and they're strung out, they're just not going to get the case. Well, we, we are in it. the state, the home of the uh, Miami Vice. Do you remember that show or yeah, were you too little? I do. I do. Miami Vice. That guy was from Wichita, Kansas. Oh, yeah. He went to East High School. Uh, he's the only, the only uh, famous guy that made it out of Wichita. <laughs> um, another question. Um, she's um, just got out of school. Um, if you go to the internet uh, or the, um, the IDF meeting in Cologne, Germany, it's the mm -hmm. largest dental meeting in the world. Uh, they meet in Cologne. Um, America has a very fragmented meeting market. All 50 states have a state meeting. Then you got the ADA, you got the Hinman, the Yankee, the CDA. But Europe, it's very consolidated. Cologne, Germany, which is the neatest city, was the furthest outreach of the Roman Empire. They still have the wall around there. Right. It was, it's, so, it's the only place you can get Italian, really good Italian food in Germany. It's just the greatest city. Anyway, they have a meeting there every other year. Minimum 100,000 dentists show up. The whole city knows that they're going to be invaded by 100,000 dentists, and all the locals help you get on the trains, everything. It's just so cool. But gosh darn it, there were um, over 200 implant systems for sale. Yeah. And she's like, okay, I'm, I need to learn how to, I'm going to learn how to place implants, but I, I, I can't evaluate 200 implant systems. No. Can you shorten that list to her? And yeah, stick why? to one of the major companies that has good local rep support, period. You know, there's titanium titanium, yes, but you're fresh out of school. You need help in ordering parts. You need a rep that can be there that's knowledgeable in your system that can make sure you get the right parts that may be able to show you how to do something. A major company that can help get you to CE, get you to study clubs. And so for me, that's like basically saying the Strawmans, the Nobels, uh, Biomed Zimmer, 3i, you know. Uh, Strawman Nobel, 3i you know, is, is Zimmer stick, Biomat, right? Yeah, I think you have to stick to one of the major companies. Okay, and, go, and, go through and the reps. Strawman Nobel, 3i uh, Zimmer Biomat is one. Uh, BioHorizons. I mean, I think the major, larger companies, you know, that, that we work with, they're the ones that are more prone to have more research behind them as well in terms of the product you're using. The standards may be higher, may, maybe not. You know, I mean, they're, they're obviously good companies. You know, downtown's very heavy, say, like with Blue Sky Bio. Great. They have a wonderful product, a wonderful li line of products. The problem is, is that it's all on the internet. It's not that you have a local rep that's going to support you. And when you are fresh out, you need to be working with known systems. You need to be working with systems that have a history of having components available later. I can't tell you how often I see patients now that are coming in with implants 20, 30 years old that need a new abutment, that need something different. And we struggle, and my prosthodontist struggles to find parts. And if they can't find parts to restore that case, I'm taking out some old implant that was placed in the 1980s that's done well, but they need to have a tooth replaced in that place, and they can't find parts for it. You know, you, you, you um, said something I think so profound. I'm always telling them, um, when you get out of school, why are you sending your lab case for a crown in the next state? I mean, you need a lab man. You need, he just said it with the you implants. Need you need lab. local support. You need a good local lab somewhere where you can actually go to and watch the process behind it. It's not second year dental school where you're in the lab casting, which they don't do anymore anyway, from what I hear. You know, they're not stacking porcelain. We, you know, we didn't do much. We processed a couple dentures in school just to get the understanding, but there's nothing better than taking a day off and spending it with your lab guy 
to see other cases coming in, see how other people's preps and margins look, and see the process, especially now with the digital workflow, so you can understand what they're doing on the back end of this crown that you're receiving. You understand that, you become a better dentist. So, so the average uh, dental office collects uh, $765,000 a year. The average lab bill is 10%. So that'd be 76,000. Yeah. Divide that by 12 months. See, the average lab is getting $6,300 a month from a uh, dentist. So they're never gonna tell you anything's wrong because they don't wanna lose your account. If they say, you know, you need to re-impress this and I don't like your prep, the, the, if the dentist says, screw you, I'm going to another lab, they just lost $6,000 a month. That, that's, and if you're an orthodontist, that's an Invisalign case. Every single month, it's an annuity. So you have to establish with your lab that he's safe. You have to sit there and say, look, I wanna learn, I'm humble. I'm as humble as Howard Pye, help me. And my guy was Wolfgang, and the Germans are the only country that make, I mean, they make Porsche and Audi and Volvo. They, they're, they're, education for a crown and bridge guy yeah. is long as long as a dental school and there was a guy out there in phoenix his name was wolfgang and he was a very old german guy and um really really tough guy and i kept telling him you know wolf tell me tell me and when i was out of school he said uh you need to come down here because it was his way of saying you're horrible and he was showing me all these 10% of all of his cases or they're just great doctors. Then he was calling them and, and fixing me up with them to go meet them and have lunch. I did the same thing with a local endodontist. You, you, you fly to San Bernardino to go see um, Cliff and, and uh, Buchanan and all these endo geniuses. Well, hell, there's an endodontist across the street from you that's done 10,000 molar root canals. Why don't you go pull up a chair next to him? It's free. You got a friend. He's in your hood. You do a root canal someday, get in trouble, you got a buddy that can help pull you out. Oh, you, you know? know, that's the thing, you have to build relationships. I had never had a problem with a general dentist coming and spending time to watch us do a case for work. But you gotta send me some patients too on top of this, you know, because I don't expect you to learn everything in two visits or watching YouTube or perusing the threads even on Dental Town all day long. That's to send the foundation to get you thinking, to ask the right questions and to say, okay, what do I need to do next? Where do I need to look under next? And what's the next step in my education? to do this part. I'm gonna do that, you build a relationship, you build a partnership, and then then at that point, then I know, okay, fine, you know, you're gonna go and you're gonna do some cases, and you're gonna get upside down at some point. You're gonna call me, and I'll take care of you, but if you've only come in to watch me, and then you go do everything, and I never see another patient from you, I'm not invested in you, you're not invested in me at this point. There's no skin in the game for me to say, you know, it's four o'clock on a Friday, I'm going home. You can deal with them since you haven't worked with me, and unfortunately, that's the way it is. But if you're someone who shows an active interest, you want to learn, you come be part of our study clubs and things like that, yeah, we'll teach you how to do things because we can't do everything, you know? And maybe I don't have the time to see Mrs. Jones because I'm out of town at this point, but I want you to still be invested in my practice. I want you to be, to know that you have someone that's here that can help you with this. So it has to be a relationship building. And I tell this to our residents all the time as well. It's like, look, just because I'm teaching you guys to place implants and you're doing pretty advanced cases here doesn't mean you're going to do all these cases when you get out. You're still green. You're still wet behind the ears even after your residency. Your job is to get your name established in the community, and it's not by being the guy that's going to come in and place another 100 implants next year. You've got to set the foundation. Your owner doc that's hiring you is going to expect you to do good crown and bridge. It's going to expect you to make the right decisions about which teeth you're going to pull or which ones you're going to refer. Same thing with endo. Which endo you're going to get involved with, which endo, maybe you're not going to do that endo retreat. Maybe that one you're going to send it to the endodontist, and you're going to be prepared on the back end to do a nice core and crown on that tooth. It's all treatment planning. I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to treatment planning. And, and, and I'll tell you another thing. Every single general dentist I know, um, I, I always tell people, you wouldn't want to go to a doctor who didn't do that procedure once a week. And as an MBA, as a dentist with an MBA, I tell you, you're not profitable if you don't do that procedure every week. So when you learn sleep apnea and you do one case every three months, you're not faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, you're not in the profit zone. If you learn to place implants, if you don't place one implant a week, you're, it's cheaper to refer. Ortho especially. I look at general dentists, they'll schedule a half an hour 
uh, for an ortho to cha change the wires in the bracket. Okay, your orthodontist, that's a 15 minute appointment, and he yeah. runs a 50% overhead. I got a ton so of you're doing a 30 do minute appointment, you're at 100% overhead. And they have assistants that are gonna do the majority of that, oh, of, that yeah. of that treatment. You know, which your assistant probably in a dental practice is not gonna be doing that, adjusting wires, and you're gonna be doing it, really. Yeah, so, and, and like my, um, our, our Megagen rep in uh, Phoenix, do you like Megagen? Is that a good one? It's a good implant company as well. Is that you know, one of the, the big ones but for I you? I don't know what their local reps are like. Uh, but know, I mean, our, our I, local I look rep, at, I, I look mean, at the mate, you know, and there are companies, you know, like we have a great Nobel rep here. I've got friends in other other parts of the country that they don't have good representation or they've got a higher turnover. So it, it's hard to say. You know, my, my old practice partner used to say, sooner or later, one of, thing, one of two things will happen. Either the product will fail or the rep will fail you. You know, it's one of, one of, one of the two that may be the issue that makes you make a change in your practice decision, you know, and it's either the rep or the product, and usually the product hands up, you know, is fine, but... And if the rep need, disappears, he'll, he'll end up at a different dental company. They may they end up never at a leave company. dentistry. Oh, not very they, rarely. But, you know, like our Megagen rep will say, um, you, you'll get a group text, say, hey, we're all meeting at the Sandbar uh, Thursday after work at 5 o'clock. So you, you'll go after work, have drinks and our with your buddies, but you'll be sitting there with six of his dentists, and then you might sit there and say, God, I don't work Friday, and then he's sitting there saying, well, I'm doing this case on Friday. So, the, the uh, and, and when they're in the operatory, so many times they'll be sitting there coaching your assistant, you know, the setup would be a lot more efficient than this is, but yeah. again, local lab, local support, local specialist, you need relationships in the hood. You, you gotta play the long game here. You really have to play the long game. It's not just about what I'm gonna do now that sounds really cool and that I'm gonna just do this. This is the patient's life we're talking about here. This is their long-term health. And you have to approach every patient in the same way and say, okay, if this is my mom, my dad, my wife, my sister, me, how would I wanna be treated with this? You know, and, and you'll see the gamut of what's available to be treated, you know, by by what's your skill set, but you have to be just be brutally honest with it. Am I efficient? Am I fast enough to do this? Am I really comfortable to do this? And at sometimes you're maybe not, but you'll build that skill set up if you don't rush to the finish line and you take the time to get the training along the way. Then you can be a really competent, very successful practitioner who has the right tools to fall on when they need it, and they have the right backup with their specialists you know, over time. Okay, this is dentistry uncensored. I know what all the politically correct noise you're supposed to say, but I know where I see a discrepancy between people's words and people's actions, uh -huh. okay? So when I talk to anyone who's placed over 2,500 implants, they never use a surgical guide. Almost none of them. And a lot of them are still on panos. And when you talk to the millennials, you have to have a CBCT and a surgical guide. So why are all my 55, 60, I mean, I got, I got 65 year old friends that have placed 10,000 implants and still use a Pano and have never used a CBCT. Um, so I, I'm not saying which one's right or wrong. I'm sure. just saying there's this huge discrepancy. The, the old folks said, I, I placed 5,000 implants before they even had a CBCT. <laughs> And, I, and they don't use surgery guys. So, so wh where do you weigh in? Because you're not an old guy and I'm you're not a, a millennial. I'm at the very what, tail. What I'm is your tail, age? I'm, what, tail, what? I'm 38. I'm the tail end of Gen X, right? So 1980. So 1980? That's, that, that's you were born in 80? End. I was born in 80. That was when yeah. I graduated from high school. There you go. Okay. So that's the tail end of like really Gen X sort of deal. And everybody's talking about, by the way, I'll tell you this. Everybody's talking about millennials now in the news and everything. But these kids that, you know, from the whole shooting thing and all, they're not millennials. You know, these are these are not millennials that that age group anymore. The millennials are done. Millennials are already the youngest millennials are already well into their twenties or late twenties at this point. So, it's, this is a generation alpha. These kids born. born so, what's now. after and, the millennials? Uh, well, there was. Oh gosh, I don't even know. My wife would probably kill me. If I won't say this now, but they, the millennials, pretty much were after millennials. There was like a generation Zeta, or I guess now, and then there's the alphas and. You know, there's a whole different group, but they keep talking in the media about millennials this, millennials this. Millennials are done. It's They're already slang, in their 20s. It's, millennials are slang for the, 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 young, the next gen, the, kids, the younger the, kids. The kids starting college now are not millennials. Yeah. They're not, and they keep being referred to as millennials. These yeah. kids in high school now are not millennials. They're not. They're whatever, Generation Alpha or whatever they are now for them. Yeah. So, but I, I would say that in, in terms of the CBCT scan, 
I mean, just look at the rest of the way we practice and the things that we do in our day-to-day lives. You don't want to go have a, you know, an angioplasty procedure performed, you know, by someone who's not going to use a CT and geography and things to do that now, and they're just going to go up by feel and do a balloon stent for you. You know, you, you want the best technology out there and the diagnostics that are there. You don't need it to drill a hole. It's routine. You've done 10,000 implants. It's routine at this point to drill a hole in bone. But I personally, I feel much more comfortable using a CT to plan my case. I know much more predictably where I want to go, what adjustments I want to make, what I want to shoot for. And I take a post-op CT as well. I take a pre-op CT and I take a post-op CT after that implant's in. And sometimes I find out, boy, I was way off on that one. Or, you know, I hit it where I, where I was. But every time I do it, I learn something. And I think it makes you a better dentist by being able to say, you know what, I would have done this differently. And there has been on occasion where I've gotten a post-op CT and I said, boy, I really missed a mark on this one. I'll take it out and reposition it right then and there because it's a lot easier for me to fix the problem right then and there than to send it to my restorative dentist later and say, you know what, figure it out for me. You know, I'm sorry I messed this so one up. So if I have them take a pano and they're holding a cat... Is that technically a CAT scan? It could be. It could be. Um, so, but, but I'll show you. I'll show you. Yeah. It's going to be hard to show you here, but I'm going to show you a, a, an incredible example I have on my phone of what looks like a perfect two-dimensional implant. And when you see it in 3D, you blow it. So, so what CAT scan are, was CBCT? I, or are I, you just, well, I'm a big is fan. it okay I, I like, to call I, all CBCTs just a CAT scan? Uh, well, to call them a CAT scan, I mean, it is definitely different. CAT scan is obviously computer tomography. In our dental offices, it's really it's a CBCT, it's a cone beam, it's a volumetric CT scan that is a lot less radiation than a traditional medical grade CT scan. Um, and there is a gamut of quality that you get from different companies and what's available. Me as a, as a maxillofacial surgeon, I need to see the whole head. I want to see the whole face. I want to see the structures that I work on from, from here to here, basically, so I can follow all my follow-ups when I want to see them without necessarily having to get a medical CT for for some of these cases. So I want to plan zygomatic so what implants. Is? Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of both ICAT and of the CareStream, like the 9300. Okay, that's why I have the CareStream. Yeah, I but is it bad for me? System. I mean, when, when, I, when I'm talking to patients, nobody knows what a CBCT is, so I just tell them we're going to take a CT. CAT scan. Tell, I tell them it's a 3D scan. I just, I, I don't mean Do you that. tell them it's a 3D scan? It's a 3D scan, you know? But, but, but is, is it not right for me to say, um, I'm going to have um, Jan take a CAT scan of that? Yeah. I mean, it's a, we'll tell is, them, is that is that acceptable? Them it's a three D scan. It's a CT scan. I mean, but, but I think that I I think they get it when they see it in three D, and I show it to them. I said, just say three D, and I show it to them. A three D scan. Yeah, a three D scan. I, t- I call it. Because I don't like scan. the word CBCT because the patient looks at your cross. My, my notes, my notes say CBCT in them, so that you know, okay. in terms of my notes. But you say a three D scan. I tell them, you know, so we're going to get a Panorex on you, which is the traditional one you may remember that goes around your head, or. Um, a 3D scan. I just call it a 3D scan because I show it to them in 3D, and I and I actually let them see when I during my consult I may plan out their implants. Okay, but on uh, okay, the CT so um, we both have the care stream, um, but the surgical guide. Okay, um, I'm a big fan of surgical guides. The last two years that I was in private practice before I went to the VA, I converted probably 95 percent of my entire practice of, of implants to fully guided surgery, even for single tooth implants. It was rare at that point for me to even have to get a patient, unless it was a guy that came in and said, you know what, do this extraction and I'm flying out of town for the next month for me to do an extraction, do an immediate implant without, you know, and freehand it. It became rare to do that. And I didn't have a patient say no to me in my specialty practice on a guide. And I just passed the cost of the guide onto them. I said, listen, I can do a case guided for you. It's gonna cost you about another 400 bucks to, to have a guide, but it's going to allow me to make a smaller incision on you. It's going to allow me to place the implant with more precision and a lot faster on you, and you'll be in and out the door, and that will already have the plan in mind of exactly where we're going. It's going to make it easier for Dr. Jones or somebody who's referring you to me to restore it, and in some of those cases, we actually had a provisional pre-made, screw attained provisional pre-made, so like it was an anterior case, I would, do, I would plan the extraction the guided implant into a screw retained position immediate with a prefab milled PMMA crown that I would deliver at the time of surgery that I would just screw right into the implant if we had enough primary stability, pack my bone around, and I'd send the patient back to the restorative dentist to have the access hole closed, and the restorative dentist would charge him for that pre-made milled crown instead of giving him a flipper or an Essex. 
great service and we're maintaining the papilla and developing soft tissues from day one. Do you see yourself uh, implementing a 3D printer to make your own surgical guides? Uh, I think it's a great idea. I don't know if I have the time to do it. And uh, I, I, I think it's absolutely wonderful that dentistry's moved to the point where now it's even affordable to have one. Um, and I would like to have one, but I, 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 see, I see things are moving in kind of two directions. One, I can't see that that 3D printer, which may give you some great accuracy and still be pretty phenomenal and get you close in the ballpark, cannot compete with, say, the 3D printers that they have at Nobel that are bolted to the foundation for less micro movement and accuracy that are actually bolted into the foundation. Who, the, who, where are you sending for your 3D surgical um, guides? Well, I, I do them through Nobel, the no, Nobel guide, Nobel clinician. Nobel guide. Um, and I also, when I was in private practice, I did a lot through MIS with M guide, which I thought was a phenomenal. MIS, which MIS, is uh, make it simple. Make it simple. They have phenomenal guides. Out of Israel, guides, yeah. bought by uh, well, they, they, were, they were just uh, no, bought actually by Densply. Densply, yeah. Densply. MIS, make but it their, simple. Their guides, I was a huge fan of their open open guides that they had. That It's called the M guide. Phenomenal guide system. And those guys in New Jersey um, were really four great. Four minutes, is that, is that okay? Okay, okay. For, um. Yeah, those guys in New Jersey were great to work with, you know, but I think primarily in my in my practice, it's really, it, it's a Nobel guide. You're sort of you're here in Florida, and um, when I was little, it was three eye dental implants, then it was bought by um, Biomed, mm -hmm. and then it was swallowed up by Zimmer, and now Zimmer is put up their whole dental implant division for sale. They want to exit that, which I think, that's kind of weird. And then Strawman bought the one of the largest ceramic dental implant deals. And then on Dental Town, lots of periodontists are starting to question. Um, they, they're seeing 20% periimplantitis on implants at five years. And at six to nine years, they're seeing 46%. And there's a lot of people starting to wonder that maybe titanium is not so inert. And maybe that has something to do with the inflammation around it. And some people are swearing by it, and it's antidotal, and that and, and there and they claim there is some research that ceramic implants are gonna have a lot less periimplantitis. Is that hokey pokey too far out there, need more time I, bleeding edge or I think you need more you, time, to be honest. I don't does know. your no. gut think that's true or well what does your gut tell you on that? I don't think there's a problem with titanium. I mean, I think that, I mean, look how many millions of implants have been placed that are still functional today with, without that problem. Yeah, maybe we're seeing it, but that might be the result again of prosthetic design, who's placing them. Maybe there's something to do with some of the different surface coatings that we're dealing with now too on them. I, I really don't have an and, answer. I don't have enough experience and to tell you. My on, but I am seeing more ceramics coming out. Nobel's coming out with the with one of their own ceramic implants as well this year. Maybe it'll be the way of the future, but I think that you know we've got a good 30 years of osseointegration with titanium now that seems to be doing fine for most people. And, and my answer to those, and I'm not slamming it because you know, the Foran family reunion, you know, out of Parsons, Kansas, and Nevada, Missouri, I mean, the, um, the, the people getting the majority of the all on fours, most of them aren't yoga instructors who are vegan who got it, ran a bunch of marathons. Right. I mean, they, I mean, in I'm in Phoenix. Most of the people needing extraction implants, they're they're hard living. They're smoking, drinking, yeah. eating their cheeseburgers. I mean, so um, it's kind of a, uh, a skewed population. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a um, what? What do you call that? A, um, a, a, a you know, it's it's not a random. You know, we're not going to randomly just choose a hundred Americans and place an implants. There's a lot of reasons why these people need uh, there is. I a mean, denture. You know, they're in a terminal dentition for a reason, you know, and it, yeah. it may have been financial costs over time, and lifestyle changes, lifestyle choices, basically, and then, uh, you know, it's compounded. So it's yeah. multifactorial, usually. So um, I, the next one's uh, line up. I got to go. But uh, last question. Again, dentistry and sensor, I'm, I'm not saying I'm for or against. I just like to ask where there's controversy. There's a lot of, and, and maybe Dennis confessed too much to me while they were out there at the bar. There's a lot of dentists who believe when, to forgive our sins, when, Howard. When, when they uh, extract a tooth that the suturing is wicking and that that's where the bacteria in the mouth get on the suture, go down there. And there are dentists who almost never suture after any extraction. And then there are others who spend more time on the suturing than they do the extraction. That's probably me. And so, so down like a mattress. 
So I see again. I'm pointing out a huge schism. Why do why do a lot of people never ever suture ever? And a lot of people like you. I've seen your cases where it had to take more time to suture than the extract. So is, so is is suturing wicking? Is it talk about suturing? Well, final question. To be honest, wisdom teeth. I t I typically place two to three sutures on a wisdom tooth case for my incision. My on partner, all four. Uh, on all four? No, no I, I, as I say, I don't suture the tops typically. Okay, so you don't so suture top, maxilla wisdom teeth. I don't teeth. usually suture maxilla wisdom teeth unless I've got an anterior release, uh, you know, for them. In the mandible, uh, I will typically place two to three sutures for, for that area. Um, and that's only for me because I felt that I had a better stabilization of my clot where I put my gel foam or whatever else in and that I didn't have to deal with as many post-op bleeding issues. And for my patients, I felt that most of them anecdotally that they from what they would report to me is that they were more comfortable. My partner, who'd been doing it for almost 30 years, only one suture on the lower, just behind the behind the second molar. And that's where he did it, and that's where his comfort zone was. Whenever I did it that way, I felt like I got a higher dry socket rate than if I placed more. So it's it's a crapshoot. I have no idea why one works versus the other, but you know, it, it, for me, I felt more comfortable having in a couple is, extra sutures. In is the three most common variables for dry socket still smoker, woman, and on birth control pills? That's what we say. I mean, my, my dry socket rate was pretty low. I'd say it was, I mean, we tracked it in the, in the, in the But is it usually was, one of those two things? It was a it smoker was a higher, and, and or an it was older, a woman? And an older patient. And an older, older patient. patient. The older they were, the more likely they were to have an issue. I always wondered since when I was in school, Matthias Horgan's oral surgery, um, um, Charlie White, I don't know if you know him, he's a um, Mahaya, Mahaya and, uh, and, and Brett Ferguson, he's Brett also Ferguson, at Meharry. Sure. And, um, he's uh, president of the AOMS this year. Right, right. Phenomenal right. guy. Yeah, he was Phenomenal my guy. oral surgery instructor. Loved that guy. God, he was so amazing. What I loved about him is he wouldn't help you until you did your 30 minutes. Because you, how are you even in there 10 minutes? You already given up? Get back in there. Um, but um, love that guy. But um, when they were telling us that um, Brett Ferguson, Charlie White, Matthias Horgan, that it was a smoker, a woman, or a woman on birth control pills. It really made me think that does estrogen? You think estrogen is a big part of that? It may clot. It, it it may very well be play some sort of molecular level in that clot stabilization. But it, you would think it's almost the other direction because you know smokers and people on birth control have a higher tendency to form clots. That's why they have a higher risk of getting a DVT. Um, a DVT? A, a deep venous thrombosis. They actually form clots. So why would they lose a clot in, in, in the mandible, you know, in, in the bone socket? And there's probably a greater role, I would say, maybe with some sort of bacterial, you know, clot lysis, basically, from having colonization of the clot. There's something in the saliva for some people, and just getting bacteria down into that clot that may cause that, you know, and then the final question, the, are you clock. using resorbable gut so you don't take out? 3-O-Chromic for 90% of my intra oral procedures. 3-O-Chromic. 3-O-Chromic is what I use for probably 90% of my cases. So you got to get them back to take it out? No. Chromic is chromic, gut? Chromic, chromic, chromic gut, yeah. 3.0 chromic, 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 chromic gut, who makes that? Uh, almost every company. But I heard they're not using it in Europe anymore. They've stopped using it in Europe. But 3-O-Chromic um, is, the, is the resorbable suture of choice for me, and I use that for... I'd say 90% of my patients. The other 5% may get some sort of Vicryl, and then the other 5% will get something like proline or nylon or maybe like a cytoplast cortex suture. So. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, seriously, um, Dr. Adonis Terzides. Terzides, yeah. And that is Greek, Greek, and more Greek. <laughs> as, um, um, so are you a big Greek food fan? I am. Final question, was Absolutely. my big fat Greek writing, did you find that racist or funny? No, I found certain parts of it that where everybody can relate to, and even cross-culturally, a lot of cultures can relate to it there. I think yeah. it's more eye-rolling because like, it's the stereotypes that you still see. That We all knew people that had family people that were like that, but for, I think for, they didn't really apply to my family or my wife's family so much. Have you ever used Windex on a patient? Uh, no, I have not, but Paradex all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, seriously, huge fan of yours. I mean, it's a, it's a couple of guys like you that, that take Dental Town from um, an amazing website to world class. Oh, you've done a pretty incredible thing with, with Dental Town, and it's been pretty cool. I've made a lot of good friends over the, over time. Uh, you know, my oral surgery buddies, you know, there's a group of them, the guys that we talk to on Dental Town. We have our own little text thread, and we, 
just middle of the day may throw something inappropriate to each other on a text message or shoot a case and get a second opinion really quick on the fly. You know, take a CT scan and scroll through and like, hey, what do you do? This guy's in my chair. And it's not even going through the dental town because we really got to get to each other, like find out how to, how to manage kind of an interesting case in the hospital or something. And so, Well, I, I can totally say that if you're not on dental town and you're not seeing his, I mean, it's, it's world-class material I've never seen in any type of a textbook or anything. And if you had a textbook, remember, it takes five years to write a textbook. And then to get their money, they, they sell it for 10 years. You post cases that were well, done. I was lucky. I was very lucky that I had great teachers all through school. From, from undergrad all the way through dental school and especially in residency, I mean, to train under people like Bob Marks and Yo Sawatari and Michael Pellig and Danny Atala, you know, Vichy Bruman and Ramsey Turson, those were my faculty people at University of Miami. These guys are the guys that write textbooks. They pioneered a lot of the techniques and, you know, and they imparted that knowledge on us and they beat us daily into submission to, to learn to do things their way. And, uh, you know, I think we're trying slowly, slowly to carry that legacy forward with them. So. Well, you're doing it in spades, buddy. Thank you very much, Howard. Thank it's been you a so much for coming on the really show. Really enjoy talking for thanks you guys. Thanks for doing an article too. last month on Dental Town Magazine. And thanks couple, for all the I've got world a couple class more. Cases. I've got a couple people recruiting some, some of my Prosto colleagues and said they'll write some more for you guys. So, Thank right. you very much. Thanks, Howard. Have a good one. Thank you.